This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, Carl Morris, and our associate producer, William Smith. Visit patreon.com slash positively trek to help support the podcast. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you all very much for your support and enjoy the show. So where I live right now, things are starting to get warmer. I'm going outside more, which is great because I've been cooped up in the house for so long with the cold weather. Well, I mean, it's not that cold in Georgia in the United States, but you know, fine. It's still a little cold, but I've been getting out more because of that and COVID and all that stuff has cooped me up. So yeah, I'm exploring the outdoors, Dan. Are you, what? How is it where you are? Oh man, it is getting so nice here as well. It's getting up above freezing during the days and uh, I'm getting outside more and stuff too. It's, it's really gorgeous. See, positive. See, we stay positive here. We're talking about positive weather. Welcome everyone to Positively <laughs> Track. I'm Bruce Gibson with Dan Gunther and welcome to episode number 98. Ooh, we're getting close to 100, Dan. Wait, 98? That can't be right. 98? We just That's celebrated crazy. our first birthday, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We did almost a hundred episodes in a year. That's crazy. That is. And you know, we were always hoping that we could do that and we did. So that's great. We've, we've been consistent. We haven't missed a week. No, that's true. I, I've been really happy that, you know, for a, a new project, especially with the two of us being busy with other stuff a lot of the time, it's really great that we've maintained consistency with this podcast. That was kind of the goal for the first year, I think. And uh, we've really done that. We've really proved that we can dedicate at least one hour a week to this project and a lot of weeks more. So I'm really pleased with this. Well, then let's take a couple weeks off. We've earned it. No, we're not. Can't drop the ball now. (laughs) Right. Yeah, we're on a good roll here we got to keep that going so yeah so episode 100 of positively trek is coming out next week but now our episodes typically come out on tuesdays of our flagship show but this time we're going to do something just a little different we're going to release it a day early just to give you extra time to listen to the episode but that's not really the method to our madness it's because we want to release episode 100 on first contact day One of the Star Trek fandom's high holy days, (laughs) April the 5th, of course, everyone knows April the 5th, 2063, is when the Vulcans make first contact after detecting Zephram Cochran's warp flight. So, you know, we celebrate it every year. It's a Star Trek holiday, and it just coincidentally is the same week that our 100th episode comes out. So, yeah, we thought it would be a great idea to have them have that episode come out on that day. It would also be a great idea if we told you what that episode is going to be about, but I'm going to hold back a little on that because we're still discussing it. <laughs> unless, unless, well, I think we can kind of give some indication of where we're going with it, but it could change, but I think we're going to stick with this. But we're going to have a discussion about the movie Star Trek First Contact. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, First Contact, one of my favorite all-time films, Star Trek or otherwise. I'm honestly really excited about this idea. I think I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I do too. I'm really looking forward to watching it again. I may watch it with a commentary. I don't know which commentary I have, but I've, I know I've got at least one out there. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing that film with you. But uh, on today's show, we've got several things we want to talk about that are in the news uh, and something that's related to Star Trek Picard, something related to Star Trek Discovery, something related to Star Trek Voyager, and something related to Star Trek Lower Decks. But before we get to that, I just want to mention that we've also started a Goodreads group. So if you are interested in what we do on our book club episodes, we plan to post in the Goodreads group the current books that we're reading and upcoming books for upcoming episodes so that you know what books we're going to cover. Now, Dan's done a good job of trying to keep you guys updated in Facebook. I've noticed that as we start to finalize the schedule a little more, it will give you, you know, maybe a few episodes out showing what's coming up on, on those book club episodes. Yeah. And Goodreads is such a great resource for that sort of thing with its bookshelves. It's really easy to kind of organize 
how that looks and stuff. So we used that similar setup when we did literary treks and I'm pretty sure they still do that over there. Uh, and, and yeah, we've decided to kind of do something similar for positively Trek book clubs. So, uh, looking forward to seeing that bookshelf grow as we move past our hundredth episode and continue on. So if you want to see our page, if you want to join it, just come over to Positively Trek. It's open. It's not a closed group. Unless people start misbehaving, then we have to close the group. (laughs) But we're keeping (laughs) it open for now. So come in and join us. Just search for Positively Trek on Goodreads, and we'll let you right in. So that's that. So, Dan, before we get to the news, something else I want to discuss with you, because there's something that... I've been thinking about lately, and it's about this 55-year mission convention in Las Vegas, which I think is in August of this year. So I know that you're not going. I don't know if I'm going because of the whole COVID stuff. I'm like, "Ah, I don't know if I really, you know, I don't know. But I am scheduled now to get my vaccine. So I now know that I'm going to have the full vaccine, both shots done by the end of April. So that's, that's awesome. Well, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's well before the convention. So now I'm like, so this is, this is how much of a Trekkie that I am. Because as soon as I schedule the shot, I'm like, yay, I'm getting the vaccine. Ooh, does this mean I could go to Las Vegas? Like, so that's one of the first <laughs> things that pops in my mind. <laughs> and I'm just like, but then I started thinking about, it, is it really going to be any fun? Because even though I've had the vaccine, not every, I think by then most people will, but will the convention still require masks? will still require social distancing. I don't know what the world of COVID is going to look like by this summer. You know, or mm-hmm. we're still going to practice. And I mean, when we go to a convention, you're all, you know, you're seeing friends, you're meeting new friends, you're being around a large group of people. I don't know if I feel like doing that with a mask, even though most of us are be vaccinated. Yeah, it it's tough. I mean, COVID is going to be with us for a long time, possibly forever, you know, and, and it's, it's all going to be kind of down to our behaviors and that sort of thing. How many people get vaccinated and, and all of that. I, I definitely don't see a return to normalcy by then. So I, I would assume there's going to still be all of those protocols in place for social distancing and mask wearing and that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's tough. I recently, there's, there's a YouTuber I watch Hank green part of the vlog brothers. And he did a really good video this week about what the rest of 2021 is going to look like as these vaccines roll out and people's behaviors change and things open up and that sort of thing. And it was really kind of sobering. I, I would definitely search for that video if you haven't seen it. It's, um, it's a lot to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, you know, will I see people in cosplay with Vulcan ears, but they have to be careful to put the mask straps over the, the points of the ears, you know, <laughs> it's like, what would it be like at a Star Trek convention post COVID meaning immediately after post well, and it's still COVID. I shouldn't say post COVID, but post all these vaccinations that are happening. You know, and I'm just curious, even from our listeners, you know, do you think you will go to these conventions, whether it's the one in Las Vegas or one later, like a New York Comic Con or anything else that's nearby you? You know, how do you feel about going to conventions in 2021? Or maybe we all just should wait till 2022. I don't know. But I'm I'm really anxious because we've been stuck at home to get around Star Trek fans, you know, Mm -hmm. and just celebrate Star Trek. Yeah. And that's the other thing is I think there's a lot of people who are just going to be so eager to get out and mingle. I I kind of predicted with a friend of mine that there's going to kind of be a rubber band effect a little bit. I think right when everything's kind of lifted and open, everyone's going to rush to mingle and, and be with their friends and stuff. And then probably about two weeks later, people are going to be like, oh, I'm sick of people. It's too much. And everyone's going to kind of retreat a little bit. And then it'll come back to kind of normal after that. So I, I, I see a little, you know, contracting and expanding there. I think a lot of people have forgotten how to deal with groups of people and that sort of thing as well. So the behavior of like, this has been a very formative event for our society i think i think there's a lot of really interesting behavioral stuff we're going to be noticing if that makes sense no it totally makes sense um 
yeah, we'll just have to see how it all plays out. I don't have to make a decision of going now, you know, at this point, but you know, I just started thinking about what would that convention be like, you know, mm-hmm. we're getting closer to it. So, I mean, I could see people going to sessions and they're still requiring social distancing, sitting apart, you know, wearing masks, but then everybody goes to the masquerade bar and they're all taking their masks off. And it's like, well, what was the point? You know, it's ironic. The masquerade bar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hmm. What does that tell us? I don't know. But anyway, that's something I just wanted to kind of put out there into the universe for us to kind of talk about and consider. And we'll see how it all plays out. So I was cruising around trekmovie.com and saw a few articles in here that I thought were interesting. So Hanalee Culpepper, director of the first three episodes of Picard and also producer of the series. Guess what, Dan? We got a win. We got an award win. She won the NAACP Image Award for directing Star Trek Picard. Oh, so awesome and very well-deserved. Uh, Hanalee Culpepper, of course, has... I directed episodes of Star Trek Discovery. She's been around the Trek universe for a little while now and absolutely deserved for her direction of uh, the first few episodes of Picard there. Yeah. And she said she didn't even realize that uh, she was the first African-American woman to start and, and direct a pilot of a Star Trek series until she was interviewed by Deadline last month. And she said, quote, two years ago, right about this time, pre-pandemic and pre-Black Lives Matter summer, I got the call. Alex Kurtzman loved my vision and was entrusting me to guide the return of a beloved hero, Captain Picard. Today, I'm honored to be nominated for an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Directing in a Drama Series for the Star Trek Picard pilot. When I got the job, I didn't realize that was the first black director and first woman director to launch any Star Trek movie or series. Why? It never crossed my mind. I was too busy thinking about the work. End of quote. (laughs) (laughs) So that's great. Yeah, really excellent. I've always enjoyed the direction of the episodes that she's done. So, I mean, she was such a perfect pick to start off Picard. Yeah. And when I think about her directing, I just think about those first three episodes and the vineyard scenes and uh, just, yeah, all the, the, the wonderful acting that's taking place in those episodes. I mean, there's some people I talk to that say they like Star Trek Picard, but they think the first few episodes are their favorites, that that was Hmm. the best part of the series. Yeah. I think a lot of that could come down to her directing for sure. There's a lot of really great shots and really great choices made in those episodes. Yes. And I'm sure we're going to see more from her. And, you know, I was looking at IMDB at her page there just to see what else she's been doing. And right now she's doing post-production on an episode of the pilot, as a matter of fact, for the new Kung Fu series. Hmm. And she's also uh, going to be working on some episodes of true story, but which is coming soon. But then there's a whole bunch of other things she has on here. And some of the things that stood out to me are Supergirl and the flash and Gotham, especially Mm -hmm. like Gotham. Gotham was a really great series. At least I liked it. Yeah, she's a very prolific director. She's done a lot of, you know, big name projects that a lot of our listeners have probably seen and enjoyed her work, maybe without realizing uh, that she was the director. And and yeah, everything she's done that I've seen, that I've definitely enjoyed. Me too. So yeah, we'll see more from her, I'm sure. And maybe she'll be even directing an episode Discovery in the near future. I don't know. But we do have a bit of a Discovery update. Uh, you know, it's... It's not much, but there's an interview with Anthony Rapp that was on a podcast called It Do Take Nerd with Jackie Cox. Why <laughs> I love we that come, name. Yeah, why didn't we come <laughs> up with a name like that? <laughs> it Do Take Nerd. I, hmm. I've never listened to it, so I'm not sure the context, but I like the name. <laughs> I haven't either. And again, this is on trekmovie.com. And they took a quote from Anthony because he gave a tiny, tiny hint on season four. And I do mean tiny. And this is what he says. One of the cool things, I can't tell you anything specific at all, but there's an actor this season that I haven't really got to interact with one-on-one. That's been one of the pleasures of season four so far, getting to expand my repertoire of who I get to play in the sandbox with. So who could that actor be? (laughs) 
(laughs) (laughs) Because when he says someone I haven't really got to interact with one on one tells me it's somebody who has already who has been on the series. It's not somebody new. Right. I I really hope this isn't something similar to Paul Bettany and that interview he gave about WandaVision where he said, oh, in the season finale, I'm so excited to work with an actor that I've I've always really wanted to work with. And it was like all a joke because he played against himself. (laughs) It was the two visions. (laughs) Spoilers for WandaVision. I don't know. I'm not giving too much away, I hope. But the joke was he got to play against himself. Now that definitely won't be the case here because Anthony Rapp has played against himself already with the mirror universe, That's Paul true. in season one. So uh, I hope it's not a bait and switch like that. That was my first thought reading this. Like, Oh, I get to work with an actor. I've always wanted. I'm like, Oh, this sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the article from Trek movie, they're saying it could be book. Did we not see scenes, Stamets and book together? I mean, I guess if we did, yeah, I don't think so. It would have been really brief, but yeah, I hadn't even thought, I bet that's who it is. Yeah. That makes sense because their stories are now pretty closely linked. What with Paul and book both being able to run the spore drive basically. So it kind of makes sense. There might be some rivalry there. There might be some professional collaboration or something there that could be really interesting to see. I bet that's it. Yeah. Just what you said there, because I can see there's a scene where they're like, all right, get the spore drive up and going. And books like, I got it. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I got it. (laughs) (laughs) And there's a debate. Who's going to do it this time? It's my turn. No, it's my turn. You did yesterday. I do today. uh, So mm, we'll see. Also, Anthony Rapp talked about Adira's story as being classic Star Trek. And this is what he said. Star Trek has always been a way to look at racism to look at differences, at class stuff. Because it's taking place in a world that doesn't exist, so they can use the lens of different alien species and cultures clashing, as opposed to human beings with different skin color clashing. I do think that this stuff that we're exploring with gender expression and identity is resonating newly. And it was an open question for us. 900 years in the future, what will these conversations be about gender? We think that's going to be pretty well handled. So yeah, That's the attitude that Star Trek takes. It's handled. You just are that, and you say that you're that. There's not controversy around it. You don't have to explain yourself. Blue's character of Indira simply turns to Stamets and says, I'm not a she. And then that's it. There's no conversation that has to happen. And I love that because we talked about Mm -hmm. that too at the time. It's like, it just was like, oh, I like to be called they, not she. And Paul Stamets is like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Stamets just says, okay. I love that. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things in the season and just a great Star Trek moment, a great learning moment, I think, for a lot of people, too. Yeah. And no one else in the cast on the show made any big deal about it. It's just like, oh, okay, that's who you are. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. You know. (laughs) So, I mean, it really should be that simple. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. That's the beauty of Star Trek because people see that and think, oh, that's the way it could be. Or maybe that's the way it should be when you see an example of like a, because, you know, current day shows can have a scene like that, but they may play it up more where somebody's like, well, wait, why, why do you want to be called that? Explain to me that it, like it might, you know, it might create a thing about it. We're trying to show the future of we get it. We get it. Mm-hmm. Okay. No big deal, people. Well, you know, that's your pronoun. We understand. Absolutely. Yeah. And there you go. So (laughs) that's the beauty of Star Trek Discovery. And there's a beauty about Star Trek Voyager, too. So we know about this documentary coming out. I still haven't contributed any money to it yet. I keep forgetting. (laughs) But it has a name. It's called To the Journey. To the Journey. (laughs) To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. Oh, very cool. You know, that to the journey comes from the final episode at the beginning of the episode where there's a toast to the journey. And actually that was even used on uh, the title of a podcast on Trek FM. The Voyager podcast is called to the journey. So I, when I keep seeing this title, I keep thinking of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is the perfect title for this documentary though, of course, because Uh, You know, similarly, the Deep Space Nine documentary used the season finale 
what what you leave behind and the documentary was called what we left behind so it makes sense to kind of take a cue from the voyager finale with that whole to the journey toast that they do and it just really is the perfect title for this you know it's 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 a celebration of voyager it's to the journey i love it yeah and you know there's a part of me that did wonder did they hear the podcast and go oh yeah that's a good title that came from the final episode mm, i don't know but here's the cool thing, too. They're still raising money. And as of this recording, they're getting closer and closer to raising enough money that they can take some of the Voyager footage and present it in HD. They did that with the Deep Space Nine documentary. Now I'm curious to see Voyager in true high definition. That's really exciting. Uh, definitely. I mean, I had a lot of favorite parts of the Deep Space Nine documentary, but seeing that footage in high definition was one really special part of it for sure. And Voyager, I think, deserves that sort of treatment as well. And as has been mentioned on other podcasts and by other people, CBS is probably going to be all for this. The recent trailer for uh Paramount Plus and and the Star Trek content on it actually used some of the upgraded Deep Space Nine footage in that trailer. So, you know, that was crowdfunded for that documentary and CBS was able to use it in their promos. So like I could absolutely see some sort of back and forth for Voyager footage as well. I would imagine that they would be thrilled to see that happen. So especially since it's crowdfunders that are paying for it. <laughs> I wish that we could do a crowdfunding just to get the whole series into HD and for Deep Space Nine, because those are the only two remaining ones. I mean, did they do anything with the animated series? I don't think anything in HD. Uh, I do. It is on Blu-ray. So I think it is in, in high definition, but it, it's it's the same footage, but just high def. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I'd like to see them upgrade the Voyager and Deep Space Nine every episode. And I know they probably have to go back and do stuff with the special effects, but do you think we'll ever see that? I don't know. I, I really would love to. It's, oh man, it's one of those things. It does show its age. Unfortunately, when you watch it now, there's there's some pretty rough stuff when you watch it on Netflix or even DVD. But I I don't know. I hope so. But it's like every year it seems to kind of just get a little further away. I keep hoping that CBS or Viacom CBS is so behind Star Trek right now and they're building this library of new content and having it featured on Paramount Plus that eventually down the road, it may not be in the next year or two, but they would upgrade these to HD if things become cheaper to do it and maybe faster. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean... It could be 10 years down the road because to your point, it's showing age. And if this is an important property to them, I would think they would do it. But at the same time, I think they look and go, but these also aren't necessarily the most popular of the Star Trek series to the general audience. I mean, you know, some people who are hardcore Trek fans like us, some, you know, would say, oh, well, Deep Space Nine or Voyager is my favorite or whatever. But to the general overall audience, not so much. Yeah, there's a lot in the in both columns, I think. And I I I really hope someday somebody looks at that and does a cost benefit analysis and it comes out that like, yeah, it would make sense to upgrade this. Especially with a lot of those new technologies we've seen with like AI being able to do some of that work a lot more cheaply. I don't know. I, I really hope someday it's just a matter of flicking a switch and it can change and it would be awesome. <laughs> you know, maybe one day it does become that cheap and easy. Uh, and on that day, I think it's you know, a no brainer until then. I don't know. I just, I hope that cost benefit analysis tips over into, yeah, it's worth it to do it. Cause it's my understanding that when they did this for the next generation, it was for the Blu-ray sales and the sales mm -hmm. weren't where they were expecting them to be. Exactly. And TNG, it should be admitted, is a lot more popular, I think, than Deep Space Nine and Voyager. So, you know, maybe as, like I said, the technology becomes cheaper, then that can tip the scales a bit. But yeah, all things being equal, I just don't see them making that decision especially given, like you say, how the, the Blu-ray sales performed. Yeah, because that was the incentive then to do TNG 
and high definition was for the Blu-ray sales. Now what's the incentive? It's not, people aren't going to subscribe to Paramount Plus just because Deep Space Nine and Voyager are in HD. I mean, that's not, exactly. that's not the incentive there. And the original series was done because they were re-releasing it out into syndication. So they were putting it out in the marketplace again and then also wanting to release it on HD and Blu-ray. So there was two incentives behind the original series. We're not really seeing that Deep Space Nine and Voyager, but I think you're right. I think, you know, some technology, some AI thing, we'll get it, but it's it's going to be a while. I don't expect it anytime soon, unfortunately. Makes me sad, Dan. You just depressed me. Ugh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Darn reality. <laughs> we still have them to watch. But, you know, there's also that you can look at and go, well, but, you know, this is what they look like back then. Actually, they still look better than they did then. <laughs> you know, there's like, you know, that kind of retro thing to it. I guess. <laughs> so we do have a trailer out. No, it's not for a movie. We're not discussing any new movies coming out on this episode. We don't have any new rumors or anything <laughs> to talk about. No, this is for Star Trek Lower Decks coming to Blu-ray and DVD on May 18th. And they released a trailer. Now, to me, there isn't a whole lot to say about the trailer because the trailer almost plays like the trailers did for when the series premiered. But, you know, we do see little clips of the different special features that we'll get in there. So that's exciting to me to see some of the cast in there and some of the features about the Easter eggs. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the animatics for deleted scenes. That was one of my favorite bits of the trailer for sure. And then, as we've mentioned before, of course, the Easter eggs are a huge part of this that I'm really excited about as well. <laughs> wow, Easter's coming up real soon. Is this a coincidence? Or is this meant to happen? We get a trailer that shows Easter eggs near Easter. Huh, there you go. You never know. <laughs> no, you never know. Yeah. But now you're still planning to get the steel book, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I haven't pre-ordered anything yet. But uh, the steel book, that is always kind of nice to get. So, yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah, I've never bought a steel book. Maybe I'll do it for this one. But we've got till May 18th. So, we're just about a month and a half away from, from getting this. So, that's exciting. So let me just ask you something. Once you, once you get it, will you rush home? Well, no, you're going to probably have it. You're going to order it. Once you get it in the mail, are you going to open it up immediately and pop into disc? Are you going to like sit on it for a while and wait until the perfect time to start playing it? <laughs> I'm kind of bad for that. I actually didn't open my Picard Blu-ray till fairly recently and, and I got it when it first came out. So I'm, I'm kind of bad for that. I think what you and I need to do maybe is commit to doing like an episode of positively Trek where we review the special features of this. And then that will make me absolutely open it as soon as I get it. <laughs> Same here. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I have a tendency tendency to get a Blu-ray like that. And then I hold it for a while because I'm waiting for the perfect time to watch it. You know, mm -hmm. having a wife and two kids and things going on. I don't want to sit there and, okay, I'm going to tell you. So in my family room, we've got the TV, right? And, but the kitchen's right there too. So it's hard for me to watch TV or watch a Blu-ray on the TV when there's all this commotion in the kitchen and my daughters and my wife are talking or they're cooking and there's like, you know, the garbage disposal starts running. It's, I'm like... Oh, now I've got to rewind because I missed hearing that or whatever. I always have to have the perfect moment of just complete silence and dedication that I've de de dedicated a certain amount of time to just this. And that's why it yeah. takes me a while. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling for sure. Uh, I, I don't have the kids, but yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, you you want to have some alone time. You want to have some quiet time, some time when you're not going to have to get up and deal with something. Yeah, I, I absolutely get that. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes somebody gets a phone call and then they're talking. And I'm like, come on. It's like, <laughs> we don't have cords anymore. You don't have to be talking on the phone in this room or walking through the room. Go somewhere else. I'm watching Star Trek, people. Can you not see that? <laughs> but anyway. The, you know, the difficulties of life, oh, the struggles, yeah. these are the big things in life. <laughs> I mean, and honestly, first world problems, but right. there's still issues. There's yeah. still issues. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, that's all we have to talk about today, unless there's something else that uh, you want to get off your chest, Dan. Come on, tell us what's going on. Uh, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I think things are good. 
Good. Check out my eBay store. Buy my stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Take I saw out. something. Oh, really? <laughs> you don't want to talk about that? Oh, we can if you want. Yeah. yeah, I saw something the other day. You posted something about eBay. Have you ever sold through eBay before? I made my very first sale on eBay just the other day. I've never done it before. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning that whole side of it. <laughs> now, are you selling Star Trek stuff? I haven't looked. Mostly Star Trek stuff. I have a whole bunch of other stuff, too, that will eventually be listed. But right now it's all Star Trek stuff. Yeah. So what was the first thing you sold? I sold a Star Trek Beyond Spock Funko Pop. Oh my gosh, we were just talking about the Funko Pops last week. Yeah, exactly. They're, they've been sitting in boxes and I don't really display them or anything. So I thought, what the heck, you know, I need some money. <laughs> I may as well sell them. <laughs> wait, wait a second. So last week we were talking about Funko Pops and we were like, yeah, we usually get them at gifts and oh, maybe we should get some. And you just sold one away. You're getting rid of them. <laughs> we have to replace yeah. it with another one now. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Making room for the new ones. <laughs> That's it. So what else are you planning to sell? Um, trading cards is kind of a big thing right now. I have a bunch of those that I'm, I'm looking at selling. So, yeah. But you have a special one that I'm assuming you're not going to sell the Spock one. Oh yeah. I got an all metal Spock card out of a Star Trek discovery set numbered 26 out of 50. It's a metal card, uh, with a painted portrait of Spock, uh, the Ethan Peck version of Spock on it. Yeah, I looked on eBay. It is worth a pretty penny. People are selling them for quite a bit. I am not getting rid of mine. <laughs> I love it. It's so pretty. <laughs> so the money isn't going to tear you away from it. It's it's that valuable to yourself to keep it. Exactly. Yeah. No, this is, it's mine. Back off. <laughs> so what other Star Trek things do you have that you will never part with? Books. <laughs> I won't get rid of my Star Trek really? books. Really? Okay. No. And why is that? I don't know. It's just such an important part of, of my Star Trek fandom. Yeah. yeah. I feel the same way because I've been going more of the ebook route because of space and because of the convenience because I can I have my phone with me most places and you know, it's like, oh, well, I'll do some quick reading since I have my phone with me. I'm not always carrying a book with me. But I, I debate about the idea of like, well, should I get rid of the books? Because I have a lot of those as ebooks too. So some of them I don't need. But to your point, it's like, I, I, they're my babies, right? I can't, somebody once told me that having books on your shelf, especially ones that you read are like trophies. It's a trophy mm -hmm. on your shelf. So showing, showing what you've read. Absolutely. Yeah. No books are, I, I, I love the Star Trek novels and, uh, you know, I'm not looking to really expand my collection of old ones that I don't have. I do have enough, but you know, I don't want to get rid of them. There's so many times I've, even a book I've read a bunch of times, I've gone and back and pulled it off the shelf to reread it. So I don't want to lose them. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You, you've touched my heart because I totally relate <laughs> to that. <laughs> but sometimes I think about bigger books, like reference books or something that I've read once, but I probably won't read anymore. And maybe it's out of date. And I think, well, maybe I should get rid of that. But I just haven't. I can't. I've never done yeah. eBay. I mean, never sold anything. I bought things before, but never sold anything on eBay. Yeah, it's interesting. There's there's a lot. It, the shipping's a bit of a pain as far as the cost and that kind of stuff, but uh, it, it eats into the profits a lot, but that's okay. It's, you know, money I didn't have before, so it's good. I know I'm getting rid of clutter. Oh, my child, you should never eat into the profits. You just need to give to the profits. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Kai win for the day. <laughs> nice. I like it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Dan, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions and my book review website, treklet.com that I'm trying to kind of get going again and get more active over there. I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. I'm still just shy of a thousand followers. It's just not moving. I think there's 985 people out there that were willing to follow me and nobody else is at this point. <laughs> I've reached my max. So I'm sure all of you are following me. And if you're not following me by now, that means you don't want to follow me or you're not on Twitter. So I'm, I'm at my max. So anyway, you can also find me on Instagram at Admiral Rex. But I don't really post that much there, so that's probably not worth it. But you can also email me if you want to at admiral underscore rex at yahoo.com. And you can email the show at 
positivelytrek at gmail.com. We have our Facebook group. It's a discussion group. It's closed. You have to knock on the door. We'll let you in. So search for Positively Trek on Facebook. As we mentioned, we have the Goodreads group. That's open. It's not closed. It may eventually get closed, but right now it's wide open for you. And of course, follow us on Twitter at Positively Trek and on Instagram at Positively Trek. And we'd like to thank our associate producer, William Smith, who I know is Bill Smith of Trek Geeks. We thank you so much for your contributions here to the show. So thanks everyone for joining us. We have our book club episode coming out this Friday and it's One Constant Star by David R. George III. It's a lost era novel and it features Captain Demora Sulu in it. So we'll be discussing that book. And next week we have our 100th episode coming April 5th, a day early on Monday, First Contact Day. So we look forward to seeing you then and continue to stay positive.